Hi, so the purpose of this video is to share some of the tips and techniques that I've learned over the eight years or so that I've been coating Tesla coils with epoxy. Okay, so first let's go over some of the things that you need. Uh, the first thing is obviously the epoxy. Now, uh, you can get this from various home improvement stores. I got this one from Home Depot. Uh, I find that usually they put it in the, in the aisle that has the varnishes, and it's usually right next to that. Uh, next, you're going to have to have some solvents. Uh, I like to use uh, isopropyl alcohol and acetone. Acetone I use for the, uh, the more epoxy covered things, like these scrapers, for instance, after the process are going to be covered in epoxy, and the acetone really cuts through it, whereas the isopropyl alcohol won't cut through it as much. But that's still useful to have because it's a lot cheaper than the acetone, and you can use the isopropyl for cleaning up your secondary form and cleaning up other things that may just have a little bit of epoxy residue on them. Okay, so next you're going to want to have some kind of container to mix the epoxy in. Uh, I found that larger containers tend to work a little bit better because it gives the epoxy you know, a flatter space to spread out on and it doesn't tend to heat up as much in the pot as if you use a smaller, you know, smaller diameter container that concentrates the epoxy more and allows it to heat up and that really shortens its pot life. Okay, so next we have our plastic scrapers here, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are really nice. I like this one. This one's really big and allows you to spread a lot of epoxy over the area. The smaller one right here, I tend to use for uh, mixing the epoxy because I, I find that it puts fewer bubbles in the epoxy than, say, a smaller stir stick might. Uh, you're also going to definitely want to have lots of paper towels around. Um, and gloves are a must. Uh, one note about the nitrile gloves that I have right here, they're not too compatible with the acetone. So if you're wiping something down with the acetone, be very careful about how long you're wiping it down because the, the gloves will start falling apart on you. Uh, another thing we want to have is a heat gun. Uh, this is just a cheapy Harbor Freight heat gun. I mean, I, I find that this style that has a lower airflow is better. You don't want too much airflow because that's going to blow a lot more dust into the epoxy and it can also tend to blow the epoxy away too much, which is not a good thing. Um, this right here is just a, you know, a scrap container I had that I used for putting in, you know, waste epoxy. And so after I, you know, finish pouring out of this container, I'll kind of tilt it up so that the rest of what's stuck on the sides pours into there because that's less work to clean up later. Okay, so now onto the secondary. You'll see that I have a winding slash epoxy coating jig made up here. And I got a nice uh, gear motor on it. Um, you know, if you don't have a gear motor, you can use something else like a cordless drill. Uh, it's really nice to have a uh, adjustable supply like that so that you can really get the speed way down on the epoxy because as you'll see later, you definitely want to get that speed down because that's essential to the epoxy leveling off. If you spin the form too fast, the epoxy is never going to level, the bubbles aren't going to come out, and you're just not going to get as good a results. Uh, this is kind of optional, uh, space heater. Depends on what time of year you're working on the epoxy. Obviously, if you're working on it in the summer and you're in a warm garage like mine usually is, you're not going to need that space heater. Um, I also like to use the space heater kind of towards the end of the curing process, like maybe three, four hours in after the epoxy is mostly set up. I'll put the heater on it and that greatly accelerates the curing process and you know you can with a space heater blowing on it you can have it cured in uh, a lot less time than it would at normal ambient temperatures. Okay this part is optional uh, this is my vacuum chamber which I use to degas the epoxy after I've mixed it. Uh, you'll notice when you mix the epoxy a lot of bubbles tend to get in the epoxy and this is a great way to get those bubbles out. Now, you can buy vacuum chambers ready-made on eBay. I did not want to pay somebody $200, so I made this one. I happen to have a scrap piece of polycarbonate. You can probably tell from all the stuff stuck on it. It had holes in it at one point. And then I got this 12-quart stock pot from uh, Walmart. Uh, it originally had handles on it, and they were riveted through, and that did not seal. 
So I had to drill the rivets out and then I uh, NPT tapped these to eighth inch and just put plugs in. Uh, this red right here is my gasket. That's actually made from a $2 placemat that I bought at Walmart. You want to get like the, that's, I think that's the cheapest kind they sell at Walmart. It's like this foamy kind of thing and it, it actually works pretty well as a gasket. And then behind it is uh, my vacuum pump, which is a, uh, it's a Harbor Freight vacuum pump. It's the two stage one that they sell for about $150. I picked this one up on eBay for $75 plus shipping, so you know you, you might want to look around on eBay and see what you can find. You may even be able to find something better than this Harbor Freight one. Okay, so let's talk about the winding jig right here. Um, you'll see I got a big DC motor here. Um, I think it's got a 401 gearbox on it, super torquey. If you can find something like this gear motor, that's really ideal. Um, it, it gives you a lot of control over the speed and it's got a lot of torque too, which is definitely a good thing especially when your winding jig is as sketchy as this and so then I've got a Lovejoy right here it's just you know a flexible coupling between the motor shaft and whatever secondary I'm spinning now um, usually when I start spinning these things I'll have caps that I use for specific uh, you know form sizes then I'll have a piece of all thread that goes all the way through it and that way you know I can get a better grip on the form this one, as you can see, has already been coated before. I'm just going to put a finishing coat on it, so I'm actually using the uh, studs coming out of the secondary to turn it. Not ideal, but uh, I don't have a lot of choice in this case. Okay, so another thing I like to point out are these bearings right here, and you definitely want to have these if you're using a threaded shaft through the secondary, because if you don't have the bearings and you use a threaded shaft, what it's going to want to do is kind of walk, you know, it, depending on whatever direction you're spinning the secondary, it's going to want to walk in your uh, jig and then the secondary end cap's going to butt up against you know this and it's it just makes it spin unevenly and it's not good. Okay so let's get on to the mixing. Uh, when I'm mixing this epoxy I always like to start with the more viscous part. In this case it's the resin and if you buy this stuff from Home Depot or Lowe's it's pretty much going to be the resin. So the reason you want to pour this part first is because it's so viscous it's going to take a long time to settle back down in this bottle and if you measure it the way I measure it I put the bottles next to each other and you know basically pour you know the second part until it's even with the line on the resin right here okay while the resin's settling in the uh, bottle we go ahead and clean the secondary form and uh, this is a pretty essential step in the whole process if your form is not clean the epoxy is going to crater in some areas where there's you know oils from your fingers or dust or other contaminants the epoxy just tends to kind of spread away from that and uh, it'll lead to a really bad looking finish okay so I tend to run at a pretty moderate speed uh, when cleaning it and uh, I like to use the isopropyl alcohol because it's cheap and uh, it does a pretty good job of getting you know skin oils and other contaminants off of the form Now is also a good time to make sure that your tools are free of contaminants and oil. Okay, now that the resin settled in the bottle, we go ahead and add in the uh, hardener. And uh, like I said before, key here is just to pour enough that the line of fluid right here is at the same level as the line of fluid in there. And uh, as you're doing this, you're going to want to constantly keep checking back and forth. Uh, this resin is pretty viscous too and takes a little while to settle. So give it, you know, a little while to settle out, but not too long because you've already put the hardener in the epoxy. And while it's not mixed very well, you know, you, 
you started the clock ticking as far as your pot life goes on your epoxy. Okay, just another note here. Um, if you're not familiar with epoxy, it's actually okay to have a little bit more of this. I mean, you don't want too much more, but uh, you definitely don't want to have more resin than activator. Because if you have too much resin and not enough activator, you're just going to end up with a permanent mess. The epoxy is not going to cure. Okay, so you want to mix this pretty quickly um, because, like I said before, it's it's all about time. And once you mix the ingredients, you know you only have a certain amount of time, and that really depends on the ambient temperature, or well, specifically the temperature of the epoxy. But uh, you know, a good rule of thumb is you know if you, if you don't have it on the form and looking nice within about 30 minutes or 40 minutes, I mean, it's going to be too late. And uh, really, I try not to let this stuff sit in the pot longer than about, say, 10 minutes. And you just want to make sure that it's really well mixed, because if you have uh, pockets of epoxy in there that it haven't mixed with the hardener, it's just going to stay goopy forever, and uh, that's not good. Okay, so this step is optional, but I find it greatly improves the results. Um, just take your epoxy, put it in your vacuum chamber, and start pulling a vacuum. Now I find that uh, you usually have to get a pretty good vacuum on this for it to really start degassing. Okay, so as we get more vacuum, you'll see that the epoxy is starting to foam up. Um, this is why I like to have a very large container compared to the epoxy I'm mixing up because once you pull the vacuum on this, that foam rises up quite a bit. And uh, when I first started using this vacuum chamber, I was putting the epoxy in uh, like red uh, plastic cups because you know they were cheap and I was used to throwing them away after each batch. But that's, uh, that's kind of just a recipe to make a mess in your vacuum chamber. Uh, when it's that confined, the foam grows really big and it kind of topped over the uh, red cup and uh, got in the inside of my vacuum chamber and some of it got on the lid and yeah, that's it's just not, not what you want to happen. Okay, uh, we're about done degassing now and you're really never going to get all the bubbles out. And keep in mind that this is under vacuum, so while the bubbles may look big, as soon as you start airing it back up, they're going to shrink down to tiny little bubbles. Okay, so now we're ready to pour this epoxy, and I like to use a fairly moderate pace. Uh, I can't give you exact numbers, you just kind of have to feel it out. But you don't want it to be so fast that the epoxy is flinging off, but also you don't want it to be so slow that it just kind of sloughs off of the um, secondary without ever getting a chance to be deposited. And uh, I kind of put the scraper down here below the form and as the epoxy pours over it kind of spreads it out. Uh, you will get some of it that you know doesn't make it on the form. That's okay uh, as long as you know a significant portion of it makes it onto the form you're good. All right, and this is where it comes in handy to have, you know, a crummy container that you can let the bucket drip into. It's going to be less uh, epoxy to clean out later after we've got the secondary taken care of. Okay, so what I do is I kind of try and spread this out as evenly as I can with the scraper. Um, but there's only so much you can do with the scraper. I mean, as you can see, it's it's leaving lines and the epoxy and uh, you, you can't just use the scraper forever. Oh, and make sure that you set the uh, scraper somewhere clean 
in case you need to take it out again later. Uh, you don't want to put it in like a pile of dust or something because all this epoxy that's on the scraper is going to pick up that dust and if you have to smooth out a bump or something later you're going to put all that dust into your secondary. Okay so now is usually when I start turning the speed down and uh, this is where having an adjustable supply really comes in handy because it allows you to uh, tweak the speed just so. When I find the right speed, I'll, I'll usually look at the bottom of the form to see if there are little uh, bubbles or um, drips that is forming. And uh, you want to go for that speed, just where the drips are forming and where it's starting to kind of come off of the secondary, because that means it's flowing on the form, which is what you want. You want it to flow so it'll self-level. Since this form was already coated, I didn't get to show you the process of um, doing the initial epoxy coat on it, but it's, it's very similar. Um, I still do the vacuum purge. Uh, it's probably not as critical on the first pour, but um, if essentially what I'll do is I'll put it on there, and um, once I've you know, let it sink in for a few minutes, I take my scraper and I'll turn the speed back up and scrape the epoxy all the way down to the windings so that um, you know only only the epoxy is between the windings and it's not you know above the windings since unless you have some kind of vacuum chamber to put the whole secondary in air is going to come out from underneath the windings and that would show up as bubbles no matter if you vacuum purge it or not okay so now this is the part where you try and remove the, as many bubbles as possible from the epoxy um, I use this heat gun and uh, you know, a nice technique for this is you want to turn the heat gun on, point it away from the secondary before you bring it into the secondary because these things have a tendency, or at least this one does, when you first turn it on, you know, it, some dust inside breaks loose and it will uh, come out and get onto your secondary, which is not good. Oh, also you want to have a flashlight too um, so that you can see the bubbles or if you have like a spotlight or something you can put on there it makes it much much easier to see the bubbles and you don't want to let the heat gun sit in one place too long because if you do the epoxy will heat up and it will start to bubble more and uh, you know, once you've reached that point, there's uh, almost no recovery from that. Uh, I used to try and salvage it, but um, these days I'm more likely just to go ahead and scrape all the epoxy off and wash the form down with acetone rather than let the, you know, bubbles get in the finish. But, you know, that's just me. Yeah, and make sure you don't sit over one spot too much because, like I said, you know, the epoxy is going to get hot and uh, it's going to start bubbling on its own and that, that's really not good for the finish. Okay, so sometimes uh, along the course you're going to get hairs or dust that settles in the epoxy and I found that you can take uh, fine tweezers and this is especially if you have a form or like this that spins really slow. You can pick that stuff out. And the neat thing is you can kind of pop some of these bubbles too. Well, that's pretty tedious, so I don't really, I don't really do that very much. So I mentioned the dust, and you really do want to try and do this in the least dusty environment you can find. Um, I strongly recommend against doing it on carpet because then just your movement's going to stir up dust. Uh, I'm doing it here in my garage, which is, you know, I mean, it's not the, the least dusty environment ever, but uh, I'm the only one in it, so not a lot of dust is being stirred up. I'm also very careful um, that I don't move around too quickly in here and stir up dust. Uh, also helps, uh, by the way, to uh, clean the floor.
and surroundings before you know undertaking something like this just to eliminate that extra dust just another note about environmental conditions um, there are some conditions that are more adverse to getting a good finish than others uh, specifically high heat and humidity which um, in, the, in the area of the country I live is is often a problem um, so y you really uh, probably want to wait until night if it's you know in the middle of the summer and it's hot and humid okay I think that's about as good as I'm gonna get it um, there definitely is such a thing as messing with this too much and you really don't want to cross that line especially with the heat gun that's that's what can really mess you up if you put too much heat into this epoxy it's gonna start curing vigorously and that you know makes bubbles come out of it and just leads to a bad finish so make sure you're really careful with the heat gun and you know it, it probably will take a couple times to get used to the whole process of uh, putting this on I know it did for me okay so while I'm babysitting the uh, form I'm gonna go ahead and start the cleanup process uh, you really don't want to wait too long because uh, you know once this epoxy sets up it's a lot harder to clean and this is really where you want to use your acetone um, you know this much epoxy yeah you maybe could do it with the alcohol but uh, it's a lot harder and yeah this acetone just really cuts through it another thing of note um, can't see it very well right now because I have this turning extremely slow but uh, you definitely want to make sure that your secondary in there is well balanced and doesn't have a lot of run out because if it's wobbling as it's spinning that's going to lead to the epoxy being deposited unevenly across the form which if the wobbles bad enough you definitely will see as like a lobe of epoxy on there or you know maybe just like ridges of epoxy. So one last thing, make sure you have something uh, fairly sturdy like a cardboard box or something underneath your um, you know, your jig because epoxy is going to come off and um, you know if you use something like paper or whatever it's going to kind of seep through that paper and then stick to whatever surface you have it on. Uh, I find cardboard works pretty well. It's cheap. Almost everybody got a box in their house. Um, and uh, you don't care about the epoxy getting on it.